If it turns out the damage is due to blood cell changes, could anything be done to protect the diver? One dubious solution would be to take drugs. There are drugs which, for instance, could modify the way cells behave. There are drugs which inhibit the activation of platelets. There are drugs which we know reduce the stiffness of white cells. And there are drugs which certainly reduce the stiffness of red blood cells. Now, they could be used to good effect, presumably, though we haven't done the experiments to prove it. But would one be happy asking men to do a job for which they had to take jobs, to which they had to take drugs in order to modify their normal physiology? I think that's really quite a tricky uh, proposition. But drugs may not be necessary. During their six days in the chamber, the students' blood cells did get stiffer, but much less than on air. It lends support to a view held by others that dives below 30 meters should not be on air, but on costly heliox using a diving bell. Below 50 meters, this is how divers work by law, because at these depths, nitrogen is narcotic. They transfer to and from work in a bell and live for 28 days in a chamber at the same high pressure as their working depth, 10 or 20 times greater than atmospheric. And because decompression from such depths takes days, they could be further away from Earth than a man on the moon. Like astronauts, they change physically simply to do their job. Pressure causes changes to blood, bones, liver and body chemistry. Their hair and nails stop growing. Yet doctors believe that living and working in this alien environment is safer than deep air diving. For it's in the deep air range below 30 meters that side effects can be most severe, from blood cell changes on the way down and from bubbles forming on the way up. Heliox divers rarely get the bends. There's no question that given equivalent dives, helium and oxygen mixtures are much safer than air basically because of the nitrogen being more soluble in the fat, the structural fat of the nervous system. And divers may be more prone to bubbles than we ever realized. This rippling noise is the sound of bubbles in a diver's bloodstream, recorded through an ultrasound probe on his chest. They move faster whenever he kicks his legs. And it's now known that most dives produce bubbles, regardless of whether the diver gets the bends. Bubbles begin to form as soon as he's risen through just seven meters. So why doesn't every dive produce a bend? It's because the body is protected by the lungs. Diving would be impossible without them. Bubbles forming in the body are carried through the circulation to the heart, which pumps blood to the lungs. The lungs filter them out and the gas is breathed out by the diver. Clean blood returns to the heart and is pumped out into the body, bubble free. So brain and spinal cord are normally protected. But if a diver rises too quickly, the lungs can't cope with the huge number of bubbles that may suddenly form and he may have a bend. And it's now thought that micro-bubbles may be getting through without him knowing. These micro-bubbles will then be pumped out into the arteries. Where they end up is a matter of Russian roulette. So, surface decompression plants a potential time bomb in the diver, because it can create such micro-bubbles. The length of the surface interval is critical. If the diver exceeds it, the chamber treatment may not be enough to get rid of bubbles that have formed. When he leaves the chamber, he may still have bubbles which can last for days. And as he goes under pressure when he next dives, they'll shrink but may not disappear. These micro bubbles could then slip through the lung filter into the brain or spinal cord. As he returns to surface, a bubble grows. It doubles in size in the top 10 meters it could trigger the bends, or Ian Calder's silent lesions. I do believe that it is a wrong technique to use. I mean, the diving companies, as well as the HSC, are taking risks with people's lives, and it isn't really needed. I think it basically comes down to cost. 
and uh, they're cutting corners. And in this day and age, there should be no reason why people should risk their lives. There's no need to. I think diving can be made much safer by the adoption of helium and oxygen mixtures. And I think under the Health and Safety at Work Act, um, the contractors and the industry have the responsibility to make diving as safe as reasonably practicable. And I think we have shown, the industry has shown, that diving beyond 50 meters, 165 feet, can be very, very safe indeed. In fact, does the industry great credit. So I think the message is very clear. We should employ these procedures much shallower. But the industry claims that in the shallow waters of the gas fields, this saturation diving isn't practical. Down here, we have very strong currents. The divers really can only work safely in the water when the current's running at less than a knot, about a knot or less. And so we're restricted to fairly short times anyway. So it's, it's not always very sensible to keep a guy under pressure for 24 hours when he can only work for a couple. So we stay with the air diving because you don't want people under pressure for longer than necessary. But one enterprising contractor himself an ex-diver, has come up with a compromise, a mini-bell. It's been developed with support from Conoco and British Gas, and with government backing. Divers breathe air, but decompression is tightly controlled, because they transfer under pressure straight from bell to chamber. In the southern sector, we simply did not have diving bells, and I wanted to introduce this for the benefit of the air divers. So I set about uh, thinking how we could adapt the benefits of the transfer under pressure and larger bells, adapting them to the smaller platforms and smaller vessels, which traditionally work in the southern sector of the North Sea in the shallower water depth, the 50 meter range. On the way down, they use the bell as a taxi. Divers wear masks, and once they're fully suited, there's only room for one inside the tiny bell, so they go down into the water in rather intimate fashion. It's like diving with a bucket over your head. the bell shrinks as it goes down under water, but it doesn't entirely disappear, so when the bell reaches the bottom, there's still an air pocket. At the bottom, the divers uncoil the umbilicals which connect them to the surface via the bell, providing air, heat and communications while they're working under the platform. The bell has its own communication system and its own air supply in case of emergency. As they work their way along each section of the platform, they're never more than 25 meters from the bell. This gives them an advantage not normally enjoyed by North Sea air divers. You have always an underwater refuge, so that if a diver is feeling distressed, he can go back to the underwater refuge and sit down and take his mask off, communicate with the surface. If he thinks he's receiving bad air, he can change the air supply to the onboard air. That is a, a major advantage. Okay, Simon, make sure you've got your safety line on. At 
the end of the job, they remove their flippers and masks and squeeze up into the air pocket. With the door closed, they'll be sealed in at a fixed pressure. Okay, we've got a seal. Got a seal. You ready to leave on? At the completion of a dive, you're sealed in the bell at that same depth and the depth you've been working at. The, the bell is then brought up and locked onto a chamber system. So you haven't got that interval in between where basically your body's fizzing. On deck, the bell locks straight onto the decompression chamber, so there's no race against time. The divers will be able to transfer through, dry and relaxed for their decompression. Equalizing now. Now the bell is free to take two more divers. Because the bell seems so much safer, divers are allowed longer working times. So it pays for itself and pleases everyone. The mini bell system we used for the first time in 1986 uh, for a, a full season offshore. Um, and we didn't have one incident of decompression sickness with it. Um, if we'd have been diving conventionally, air diving, uh, you may have expected two or three incidents. Most of the time in the North Sea, you've always got at least, say, a four to five foot swell. Very rarely you get much uh, smaller swell than this. And approaching the ladder with uh, tools hanging off the diver, trying to get onto the ladder, the tools will get wrapped around the ladder, you know, he does have a hell of a job just trying to get himself up, not just the weight, but the actual stuff getting fouled in the ladder on the way to the surface. Now, the mini bell, of course, does away with all this. It's, uh, it's just the safest way to do air diving. They've designed the bell to guard against accidents in the rough North Sea. It operates over the stern, and that's the part of the ship that goes up and down the most. So the bell's movement must be rigidly controlled. It runs down into the sea between fixed guide rails, and once underwater, a guide wire ensures that it can't drift away on the tide and get lost. There's also a system to compensate the bell against the heaving motion of the ship. A computer-controlled winch raises and lowers the bell as the ship moves and so prevents it bobbing up and down and injuring the divers. It enables them to work in seas which would otherwise be too rough. The system has improved the general safety, A, the ability to get in and out of the water safely, and B, reduced the number of bends. But surprisingly, and uh, we're quite pleased about it, it's also increased our efficiency. We actually do longer dives and for longer periods than previously. So for once we've been able to tie safety into efficiency and um, cost effectiveness. So we're quite pleased with it overall. But the bell has come under heavy fire from the rest of the industry. Though backing transfer under pressure, they want the mini bell banned because it breaks one classic North Sea rule. The economics of the bell depend on having both divers out and working from it. The regulations say quite specifically that with bell diving, there shall always be one diver who remains behind in the bell as the standby diver and tender.